Hello fellow intelligent investors, my name is René Zalman and today I want to continue to talk about different valuation methods. We've already covered valuation multiples and relative valuation approaches and now in this video I'm going to introduce the discounted cash flow method, discuss the strength of this approach and its weaknesses. So without further ado, let's get started. Have you ever wondered how you can make your hard-earned money work for you? Have you ever dreamed of building generational wealth and leaving a legacy? My name is René Zellman and I'll teach you how you can manage and invest your money with confidence, a long-term vision and without losing your mind. Join me on my journey of intelligent investing and learn how smart people can compound their money effectively and accumulate wealth. All right. So in my video on relative valuation, I pointed out that while relative value is based on the value of similar assets, absolute valuation approaches and the discounted cash flow, cash flow method in particular, they examine the intrinsic value of an asset without comparing it to any other comparable assets. You essentially evaluate the asset on its own. Now there is one very important concept that you need to understand before we actually start with the DCF method. You first and foremost need to be or should be familiar with the idea that cash generative assets have something called intrinsic value and that you can calculate the present value of future cash flows with a mathematical formula. So with the help of this formula and expected future cash flows you can estimate the intrinsic value of an asset and basically sound investing always starts with the idea that you pay less for an asset than it is actually intrinsically worth. I think it's important to acknowledge that the price a stock is trading for on a stock exchange at any given moment it does not necessarily reflect the intrinsic worth of the company. Price and value are different. A disconnect between price and value can be observed on the level of individual companies all the time. But even large indices like the S&P 500 are much more volatile than the combined underlying value of the, this basket of businesses. You could just consider the March 2020 meltdown. Basically the S&P 500 fell around 35% if I remember correctly, but then finished the year up over 18%. Business value doesn't fluctuate that heavily, but the price of ad assets often fluctuates quite wildly. So the idea that stocks are always perfectly priced is simply ridiculous and doesn't pass any basic logic test. Yet, especially academics from some of the most pre prestigious universities in the world believe it to be true. Now, assets that do not produce cash flows do not have an intrinsic value. If you consider baseball cards, for instance, or maybe Bitcoin, well, as these two assets do not generate periodic cash flows, they don't have an intrinsic worth. And therefore, they are only worth as much as someone else is willing to pay for them. And therefore a DCF model or a DCF method can only be used for cash generative assets. Now we have just explained the distinction between absolute value and relative value. The most common method of absolute valuation is the discounted cash flow method. It is assumed that Warren Buffett himself uses discounted cash flows to calculate a firm's intrinsic worth. Buffett's longtime business partner Charlie Munger, well he has actually publicly said that he has never seen Buffett do a DCF. But Buffett himself has pointed out during various Berkshire meetings that uh, DCF is actually the theoretically most accurate way to determine the worth of a company. So it can certainly be assumed that Buffett is at, at the very least doing some form of back of the envelope DCF in his head. So as we already said, a DCF is based on a company's expected, expected future cash flows. It then discounts all of these future cash flows at an appropriate rate. And there are various inputs needed for a discounted cash flow method, such as the cash flow the uh, company generates today, the expected growth in the near future, a so-called terminal growth rate, which is the constant rate that a company is expected to grow at forever, the firm's liabilities or excess cash, and finally, of course, the discount rate. And if you want to calculate the intrinsic worth per share, you would also need the total number of shares outstanding. And if you plug all of these variables into a DCF model, the model will give you the intrinsic value of the company or the asset. The mathematical formula of a DCF looks quite intimidating at first and looks as follows. Now, since I don't want to do a two hour video here, we cannot get into the nitty gritty details of 
a DCF valuation method. For instance, I could probably do another video series just on how you could come up with appropriate growth rates. But I'm sure I will do an in-depth video with a concrete example at some point in the future. I can also recommend the content of Aswad de Moderan, who is professor of finance at the Stern School of Business uh, in New York. The article Basics of Discounted Cash Flow Valuation released on the NYU website is particularly helpful if you ask me and especially if you are just starting out. And I will add a link to that website in the description box below. All right, just to be clear here, I think I already mentioned lots of fancy terms here and many of these concepts might actually be new to you. So feel free to ask all of your questions in the comment sections below and I'm, I'm happy to answer them if I can find the time to do that. And of course it would also help me to increase engagement and therefore help me reach more people that might also benefit from this video. Now in my previous videos on valuation, I highlighted that all methods of valuation, valuation have their limitations. And it's important to understand these limitations. And of course, a DCF suffers from some major flaws as well. As I just said, if you put in all the variables that I just mentioned previously, the mathematical model will spit out an answer and or an intrinsic value of the company. And the DCF is based on the mathematical formula and therefore the model works. But you have to be aware of the fact that this is simply an estimate of intrinsic worth. You need to understand that a DCF is not a tool that can give you a precise value. If you use a DCF, you most likely estimate growth rates for say the next 10 years and then another growth rate from the end of year 10 to forever. And you can easily make these numbers what you want them to say. There's that phrase that to a man with a hammer everything looks like a nail. And I think this saying describes the problems of a DCF quite nicely. There's the risk that you use a DCF as a way to justify all sorts of prices. Because as I said you can easily make the model say what you want it to say by tweaking just a few of the variables. If I would change the discount rate just a little bit for instance, the intrinsic value estimate can change quite dramatically. And the same would happen if I change some of my growth assumptions or even the initial free cash flow input. And that's why you could ask 100 very sophisticated investors and ask them to determine the intrinsic value of one and the same company. And they would probably all end up with different estimates or numbers. And that's because you have to make a lot of assumptions when you use a DCF. And assumptions always carry a large degree of error. So a common rule for evaluation is that it's, better, that it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. And I always encourage people to use very conservative growth estimates and generally inputs in a DCF model. The biggest problem of a DCF is probably that most of a company's DCF value is generated in the very distant future. But can you really project what a company is going to be earning 10, 20 or 30 years from now? Can you really know whether the company will still be around in 30 years? I think we are living in an increasingly complex and dynamic world and disruptions by all sorts of new technologies can be considered part of a normal business environment. So I would say I cannot predict with a high degree of certainty that some business will still be around in 30 years. Now when speaking of DCF models, we need to address discount rates specifically because there's usually a lot of confusion about what kind of discount rate is appropriate. When you google the term DCF for instance, you will probably come across a term called weighted average cost of capital or short WAC or WACC. It's basically a rather complex formula used to calculate the discount rate for individual companies as the weighted average cost of capital measures what it costs a company to acquire funding. But quite frankly, I don't think you need these fancy academic concepts. Put in a nutshell, the discount rate should be your required rate of return. And that's really all there is to say when we speak of discount rates. The discount rate is the investor's expected rate of return. And based on your discount rate, you get the price that you should pay for an asset to earn your required rate of return. If you require a bigger return, say 15%, and thus you would use a discount rate of 15%, well then the company will be worth less today than if you require a smaller return, say 5%. Because let's just say you know that company XYZ will be worth $200 in 7 years. If you want a return of 10%, then you can pay roughly $100 for it today. 
but if you want a rate of return of 50%, 15%, I'm sorry, you obviously need to demand a lower entry price. It's really as simple as that. I actually came across the following chart on Twitter the other day, which illustrates the idea that I just pointed out. An investor should love volatility because sharp price drops offer opportunities and lower entry prices increase upside and reduce downside risk. The graph was actually shared by the Twitter user Joe Rankenfield. Go check him out. So my point is that as an investor, your goal should be to invest your capital at a rate of return that basically surpasses a return that you can easily achieve elsewhere, such as in a broad market index fund. Your individual hurdle rate for investing capital, your personal capital, should be different than the hurdle rate of a CEO. And that's why the weighted average cost of capital is irrelevant for you. As the stock market has historically returned around 10% per year, including dividends, I recommend to use around 10% as a discount rate. Surely you might argue that due to the historically high stock market valuations we are witnessing right now, that going forward investors cannot really expect a 10% return from a broad index fund. So if you want to aim a little lower, say 8%, that's fine too, of course. Other investors might aim a little higher and require a rate of return of 15%. At the end of the day, every investor will have a different hurdle rate for his investment returns. And that's fine, because personal finance is obviously personal. And this brings us to the last part of this video. So lastly, I need to talk about the concept of using a margin of safety. Margin of safety is one of the most important concepts in investing. The term was coined by Benjamin Graham in the 1949 edition of The Intelligent Investor. And he actually devoted an entire chapter, chapter to this concept, chapter 20. And he wrote the following. In the old legend, the wise man finally boiled down the history of mortal affairs into the single phrase, this too will pass. Confronted with the like challenge to distill the secret of sound investment into three words, we venture the motto margin of safety. This is the thread that runs through all the preceding discussions of investment policy, often explicitly, sometimes in a less direct fashion. Essentially, let's say you do a discounted cash flow analysis and use a discount rate of 8% and you expect for growth of 15% in the first five years, 10% between year 6 and 10, and then a terminal growth rate of 3%. Well, if the company ends up meeting your growth expectations exactly, you will earn that 8% per year that you used as a discount rate. However, one of the fundamental principles of intelligent investing is to buy businesses with a margin of safety. Basically, you are trying to buy a business that is worth $1 for 50 cents. If you think the per share intrinsic value of a company is $100, you might only be willing to pay $70 if you demand a margin of safety of 30%. The fundamental principle here is that the lower the price you pay for a business, the smaller the chance of you being wrong about a company's undervaluation. And as we stressed, valuation is not precise and future cash flows are not perfectly predictable. So if you have misjudged future growth rates and thus the intrinsic value of a business, buying with the margin of safety gives you some cushion. And as a result, you might actually achieve better returns than your discount rate if you use yeah, a margin of safety because you are just being extra careful and maybe you are overly careful and this will result in higher returns than your discount rate. So what's incredibly important to understand is that a very low price in comparison to intrinsic value reduces downside risk and increases your upside potential. The less you pay, the higher you expect a return. For example, if a business's net income is $100 per year and you pay $1,000 for the business, the expected return is 10% if we assume that profits do not grow or decline. However, if you pay only $500 for the company, your expected return becomes $20. And taking all of this into consideration, you have to answer some very basic questions. First, what is the price of the company on the stock market? Secondly, what do you think is the intrinsic value of the company? And lastly, is the stock trading at a discount so that it offers you a margin of safety?
Warren Buffett himself is known for religiously applying the margin of safety principle. And he requires a sufficiently large margin of safety whenever he makes an investment. And it is assumed that he buys businesses when they are available 50% below his intrinsic value estimate. And it's difficult to find companies trading at prices that provide a sufficiently large margin of safety and therefore potential, potentially high returns. Therefore, you can make the case for concentrating quite heavily in investments that offer such a large ma margin of safety because you will rarely find them. So what's the bottom line here? Well, I find it remarkable how many people on Wall Street and also all these wannabe investors on social media platforms come up with valuation estimates almost entirely based on past price movements. If a stock goes up a lot, analysts will simply raise the price target. And if the stock goes down, well, then they will lower their price target. Intelligent investing is all about determining the worth of an asset and then paying a lot less for it. However, any DCF analysis is only as accurate as the forecast it relies on. And therefore, you want to be extra careful when using a DCF. I know I have introduced lots of fancy theoretical concept, concepts in this video. And you might feel smart if you are familiar with all of them. But I'm sorry to tell you about this. Theoretical knowledge alone doesn't really make you a good investor. To successfully apply the tool of a DCF requires extraordinary qualitative judgment and analysis. And it requires forecasting. And maybe most importantly, it, it requires that you know what you don't know. And that should already be it for today. As always, may your finances and investments prosper. Good luck. Oh,